get thrown out, I'll go live with my mom. Mama, get out the mall. Welcome to the Real Estate and Chill Podcast, the newest and coolest podcast. So tune in. Two experts discussing the real estate market. Loan Officer James Chudley and Associate Real Estate Broker Kevin Iglesias. Beware, this is not another boring podcast. This right here is the shit you need to hear, respectfully. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome back to the newest episode of the Real Estate and Show Podcast. I'm your host, James Shotty from United Mortgage, here with Kevin Iglesias, Associate Broker. Today in the building, we got the short sale queen herself. Came all the way from Franklin Square. We appreciate you being here. Thank you, thank you. Please introduce yourself. Hi, guys. Um, that was an introduction. Um, my name is... I am uh, been doing short sales for 18 years, and my company is Bright Horizons. Awesome. How'd you get into the business? How'd you get into short sales? And, and, and can you discuss what a short sale is? Because a lot of people don't, don't okay, know. Okay, so a short sale is technically when a homeowner is in default. They haven't paid the bank, and they go to the bank, and they say, hey, Mr. Bank, um, I no longer can afford this mortgage, and I would like to get rid of it, you know? Um, sometimes you're underwater or you purchase the property for more than what it's owed. The condition takes a lot into place and you're basically telling the bank, I need you to take less than what it's owed in the property. And I would like to move forward with my life. Um, but it's not just about the mortgage. Sometimes there's a lot of other issues, title issues. There is liens, judgments, violations that you can't just sell it as a straight deal. So you have to go back to the bank and say, Hey, listen, take less, you know, and, and let me walk away from this so that I can move forward with my life. Before you got into short sales, and we'll go back into this, what did you used to do? Because 18 years, basically a veteran. So what happened was um, I was in school, and um, I lived in Florida the, my senior year, and it was 2003. And then 2004, when I graduated high school, I came to New York to visit because I grew up in New York, and I'm like, I do not want to live in Florida anymore. So um, I just decided to stay, and um, I had a job in Florida, so I transferred over here. I used to work at Marshall, TJ Maxx, so it was easy. And then I'm like, I want to be working in an office. Like, you know, like, I don't know, for whatever reason, we all, as when we're young, like, you want to work in a sneaker store, you want to work <laughs> in an office. So it was like, I, I, I don't want to be working this type of environment. I always I wanted to be an attorney, so I'm like, I was going to school for accounting, and I'm like, I need to do something that I'm not going to work in the evening because the shift was terrible. I need to be, you know, 9 to 5, 9 to 4, and then go to school. And that was my life. So I got a job at a real estate office, and I was a receptionist. And um, I remember it was in Queens in Ozon Park. So the owner used to do mortgages. The first floor was a real estate company. And the basement was a title company. So it was a one stop shop. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, he did everything there. And um, I remember I was just a receptionist. There were no agents there. Like, there were one or two. So I'm like, there's no money in real estate. Remember, I was 18. Um, my parents are immigrants. So we didn't grow up knowing anything about houses. We actually migrated to Florida because my whole family bought pr purchased houses over there. So I started doing short sales because I was seeing that people, you know, were flipping and doing stuff. And I'm like, what's going on? I was 18 years old. I went and I got licensed. I'm like, if they could do it, I could do it. Um, so then the owner said to me, Melissa, here's a short sale. Because he didn't want to pay the broker, you know, that was negotiating them. And she had all the experience. Now, remember, this is 2004. Nobody knew what a short sale was back then. There were a few banks that were doing it. Like, it's not like today that everybody knows what a short sale is. So he goes to me. He's like, Melissa, here's a short sale. Figure it out. It took me seven months. <laughs> and he gave Shorts me nothing. Not easy. He said, I'll pay you $4,000 if you get it done. Here's the number that I want. He taught me nothing. So I submitted an authorization and, and you know, I, I contacted the lender and I go to the negotiator. I said, listen, this is my first one. I don't know how to do anything. So we became friends on AIM. <laughs> right? <laughs> and, and he used to, and, ha and then MSN, right? Because you have their email. And then he used to tell me on the side, like, this is how you do it. Because 
He's not allowed to tell me over the phone. So he's like, this is how you do it. Like, this is how you submit a HUD. By the way, there was no HUD back then. There was a net sheet, you know, that just like a break. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm like, okay. And it took me seven, eight months. I got it done. And since then, I was like, I got this. Like, I was just, I was negotiating back then when there were not a lot of deals. There was no cold calling. People used to go door knock. So he had a team eventually that will know door knock. And, you know, we were, I was negotiating about 10 short sales a month, and wow. they were closing wow. them right away. It was like this, like this. But then the market crashed, right? And when the market crashed and, and my family in Florida, they were investing. So what everybody was doing is, okay, we bought this house for X amount of money. Back then, all you needed was credit. You didn't need a job. You remember back then, like, it, it was like you were buying just out of credit. So that's why a lot of buyers now, they're like, I have good credit, but I'm making $20,000 a year. <laughs> and my aunt, 15 years ago, she bought a house with good credit. I'm like, no, this is no longer how it works. So a lot of people were found themselves in a predicament where they could no longer afford these houses because being guided by these mortgages or these people or family members that they're like, just buy, 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 because everybody wants to be a homeowner. And I'm sorry, like, there's a lot of agents that do not educate their clients, and they just want to make a commission. And, you know, that's what lead, led me to, like, okay, it's it's not just about the money. There's honestly a lot of people who I've seen, who I've experienced, who are losing their house, and nobody's giving them the help. Like, attorneys are charging them a fee to do loan modification, and they are literally not paying their mortgage because their attorney advised them, let's try to do a loan mod, stop paying it, and let's see where it gets me. So seeing that firsthand from my family who was purchasing all these houses, and they refinanced to purchase another house and another house, and they were vacant because you're not knowing what the laws are for, you know, getting tenants into these properties, especially in Florida. It's totally different than New York. And they were vacant, and they're like, okay, I can't afford the house. I'm messing up my credit. I can't keep going into my savings. I can't, I'm not able to rent it. Because if you bought something in Florida, I want to say like $500,000, a townhouse that was fully built back then, mm-hmm. 2005, 2006, you can't af- who's going to pay that mortgage? Nobody is going to rent this. When the income, when the regular rent in Florida is eight hundred, twelve hundred dollars, that's no. It, do you remember what the rates were back then, or no? Do you have any like? So they were what is it? Subprime loans. There were two loans. One was is it was an eighty twenty. That's okay. why they were when Obama came into office. All of these mortgages got you know discharged off, paid off, satisfied. So the rates were let's say six percent, and then the second mortgage would have been like a ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen percent. Wow. And people are complaining now. Yeah, yeah that the, the reason right yeah, And like, that's the reason why I asked. I'm like, but you also, have no idea. The funny part is second loan, like second mortgages right now are like, it's tough to even find somebody who does them. But like those rates are obviously higher. But like for a first home, like for your first mortgage, like these rates aren't even that bad. Like they're actually pretty good still compared yeah. to what they average. But know, here's the thing though. When people saw the discount rates at two and a quarter yeah, and then, I'm and then like, now they're like five and a quarter, they're like, oh, I missed out. But before COVID. They, the but they did. They did miss out. They did miss out. But you know why? Because everybody does things based on other people's opinion. Mm -hmm. Whatever you're doing, you're going to everybody's opinion instead of going to somebody that knows what they're doing. So I experienced that a lot, even in the short sale business. Okay, maybe I should just try to save my home because my cousin, nephew, dog's family member, (laughs) Walker, was able to save it, but not everybody's in the same predicament. So my advice to anybody in this market is if you're looking to buy a regular deal, stop asking people's opinion that are not in the market. Don't even get me started on the opinions of like family members who tell them, oh, don't yeah, buy the house. Yeah, and like, it's that's like the no, worst. But, but it happens in ev- any type of market. Anything that you're doing, everybody wants. You know what it is? You're looking for somebody to say, go ahead and do it. You know, you're looking for that. Okay. For that approval. Listen yeah. to us. We're telling you to go ahead and do it. Just listen to us. Yeah. But, but and then it's like. I had clients that two months ago, they were looking to buy, and they're like, well, my mom told me that the market is going to crash during short sales. I'm like, it's not going to crash. There are going to be a lot of short sales in the future, yes. But can you afford it? Are you a cash buyer? Because that's what your competition is. It's not another person who's looking to get a mortgage. 
your competition is the another purple who has been saving to buy it cash. You know, and and it's not just that; it's the repairs that go into it. Back to what you said before, though. Like I've had clients that I've dealt with, and it's true what you said. A lot of agents don't give value to their clients. Like I've had clients that I met with buyers that are like, "All right, this is the monthly payment I want to be at." And then I always ask you, right or wrong, I always ask you, oh, what's a monthly payment on this? And if it's too high, I'm like, look, you can't afford this. Don't go house broke getting into this because yeah. you're going to regret it later on. Unless it has like an apartment where you could rent and subsidize the, the monthly mortgage, don't do it. You know, it's just, it's, it's not going to benefit you. I deal with a lot of independent, successful women who are single mother. And I'm shout just, out to them. Yes. Yeah, shout out to them. Real yes. estate, uh, yeah. are you part of the, what is that, real estate boss babes or no? No, I'm not. Okay. No, but I'm Stop saying assuming like, things. Can my bad. Clients. Damn. No, 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 like a lot of clients, and, a, and I've seen it more than ever, like women are out there, and they're like, I want to be a homeowner. Like as much as I want to own a business, I want to leave something for my children, right? And me being in the short sale industry where I'm seeing these people falling into these categories where they cannot afford these homes, the first thing I tell them is do not go, don't be paper broke. Like don't go into a home that don't have any type of income, Right. And you also have to think about it. Like, these people that fell in, into, you know, foreclosure, that they're not paying, which, by the way, it means you haven't paid for three months, and the bank has the right to go and file those proceedings. I don't mean to cut you off. How long does it take for to the bank actually foreclose depends. on it, though? It depends. I have people who haven't paid in 10 years. I know. I've seen that. I've, I've seen people have living free for, like, seven, eight yeah. years. And they still don't have any money. You haven't paid anything. The bank pays for everything. So if you want to touch on that, when, when a bank starts on foreclosure, they're paying the taxes, right, because they don't want a, t- a tax lien, because the minute there's a tax lien, they can just sell the property. Also, these people that are in short sell, if you know that you can't pay in three months and you're foreseeing yourself going down that rabbit hole, instead of asking for people's opinion, go to a mortgage lender and be like, hey, can I refinance? But there, there's a penalty, right? If, if a homeowner doesn't pay their mortgage within, like, the first six months, isn't there, like, a penalty on the bank? So how it really works is that if you have certain lates on the house, Mm -hmm. then you have to wait to refinance. Like I'm working with somebody right now who had a late on their mortgage, like right about right before we were about to close because they had like a missed payment thing. So we can refinance them, finance them out for FHA. I believe it's two lates in the past 12 months. That's all you can have. But if you have certain lates, then you can't refinance. You have to wait until you have on time payments. What was happening before with like the whole forbearance program is that you could refinance after you caught up. So there were some times where people were um, waiting to, you know, catch up on their mortgage payments. Once they catch up and they're on, you know, on track, then they could refinance. But until then you can't refinance. But I've heard so many horror stories with the forbearance program too, where like supposedly they put that money towards the back of the loan, right? Yeah. But I've heard that once a certain time period goes up, like I've, I've spoken to so many people, they're like, oh no, they want me to pay it all up front now. Oh yes. So this is the misconception that a lot of people, when COVID happened, and we're jumping like all over the place. Um, But so many hot topics. So much. But when (laughs) when COVID happened, everybody's like, "Oh no!" Like they could afford their mortgage, right? And they're like, "I'm just gonna, I don't have to pay the mortgage." Yes. Right. That's all it was. The same thing. Obama. When Obama was there, Obamacare. like, Like like everything else that he did, he bailed us out. This is the same thing because it's the same president, the same, you know, like they are going to bail us out. And I've spoken to people in the bank and I'm like, you know, what's your take on it? They're like, tell your clients to pay their mortgage. Because what happens is you're under the misconception that it's like, okay, um, they're just going to bail me out. No. And where is that money? You also have to prove the thing with a short sell. You have to prove that you are in a hardship. If they ask you for bank statements and you're getting all this money from unemployment, from people's paying your rent, you're getting all this money from actually still working, right? You're showing your bank statements because it's things that you have to show when you're doing a short sell. They're going to say, okay, so you were working. Where is the my money. money? Yeah. You know, like, where they're not just going to look at it because at the end of the day, the person who is on the other side, which is the bank, which is an investor, which is Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, they have to agree to do a short sell. If it is not up to me, it is not up to you. Every All the parties involved have to say, you know what, it is beneficial to us to do a short sell. A lot of lenders, you go to them and they're like, no, I want my money. I'm going to make an example out of you and I'm going to foreclose on you. 
And I see a lot of listings like on MLS One Key where it's like subject to third party approval. Whatever price they put up, people don't understand. It doesn't mean that you're going to get it for that price. The bank, like you said, still has to approve it if they're even going to approve it. Where you send an offer, let's say a two fifty, right? And the bank comes back and says, "No, I want three fifty. How how long are you usually in contract till you get that response? So, I'm going to speak about myself because um, there's a lot of agents out there that they hand these files, you know, to an appra- to an attorney or a third party to just negotiate the deals, and that's not really how it should work, right? So when you don't know what you're doing, no offense to anybody. Um, it's gonna take longer, right? But if you're, let's say there's home A on the property on the on the it's listed, the property needs no work because you could do a short sell on a property that needs no work, and you could do a mortgage on a property that needs no work, even FHA, as long as it goes by the guidelines. Right. You know that is not vacant because you need to have gas light working. Everybody wants a short sell, but you also need to make sure that the property that you're buying needs to qualify. Otherwise, you have to do a 203K loan. And when you're doing a 203K loan on a short sale, I don't, the guidelines are different. Like, it's not like you could come and bring your uncle to do the work for you. And people don't understand that. But going back to what you mentioned in a third party, so when you're submitting a a short sale, the first step is listing the property. When you have it listed, you have to have an accepted offer and a contract. A lot of agents just submit a sales agreement. Right, a binder. Like I have an offer, and I can tell you, besides two lenders that I work with, every other ser- banks and servicing company, they're like, we're not even gonna look at this unless you have a contract. So once you have submitted a full complete package, which is authorization, short sale package from the lender, which is an application, uh, last two bank statement, pay subs, W two, same as a mortgage statement, as a mortgage, right? So the bank wants to see everything. To say, okay, do am I doing a loan modification or am I doing a short sell? So when you submit everything, in my experience, within seven days, I have an appraisal go to the property and inspect the property. Seven days for B, uh, BPO. BPO, which wow. is a broker price opinion, and an appraisal. If it's a um, if it's an FHA, Fannie Mae, they require an appraisal, and it's seven days. So f- I don't mean to cut you off. When it's FHA, I heard that. It, but you basically have to sell it at the, like you. It's really hard to negotiate that price down, no? No, that's what I've been. It told. all depends on your negotiator. Gotcha. So I just did a Fannie Mae deal. The appraisal came in at five seventy five. We closed at five seventeen five hundred last week because I I disputed the value and I'm like absolutely not. Sometimes um, Fannie Mae deals the now reverse mortgages are a little bit harder because a reverse mortgage is like. Okay, the person is dead now, which a lot of times they're deceased. Yeah, they're older. Yeah, and they're deceased and it's like, no, I want what I want. And, you know, but with a reverse mortgage, um, if you are the heir or, you know, associated with, you know, you could buy that property back. Oh, I didn't even know. Not with a regular deal. Like, you can't benefit from the, the sale. You could do a short sale and they are entitled to potentially buy it back if they want. Now, short sale and foreclosure are two different things. Short sale is when you have the property, you go to the bank and say, hey, look, I want to sell my property for less, pay this debt off. Does it, is it a big hit on your credit? No. So, so essentially when you close in a short sale, so just to you know clarify what a short sale and a foreclosure is, you are technically in foreclosure, right, when you stop paying your mortgage. Right. After three months, you're technically in foreclosure. So a lot of people have the misconception that because the home is in in foreclosure, a lot of agents, buyers, people, they're like, oh, this is a foreclosure home. I could just go and buy it. No. Essentially, the homeowner, the borrower, still have right over ownership of this mm-hmm. home, and they have to agree to sell it to you. Not only do they have to agree, also the bank has to agree to do a short sale. So a short sale is when you go to the bank and say, I'm willing to accept less than what it's owed to me. Right, and I'm also willing to pay a lot of the tax judgments violations that are on the property. Ninety percent of the time, depending on the bank, they pay for additional stuff on title. Now, a foreclosure is when you're in foreclosure, but when you're foreclosed on the home is when the bank went through all the proceeding and auctioned up the property, and somebody else bought it, and you didn't have the right to sell it to whoever. Now, I'm just gonna explain really quickly. Um, a short sale. When you close on a short sale, you benefit from it because you don't have that foreclosure on your 
credit and you're you automatically I've seen people get a hundred to two hundred points right away because it looks like it's been paid off. It's been satisfied. Skyrocket that quickly? Yeah. Right away. When you get a short sale though, like say somebody's done a short sale or foreclosure, how long do you have to wait to get approved for an FHA or conventional? So for a short sale, it's gonna be two years FHA, four years conventional. But with extenuating circumstances, you could do two years on conventional as well. Two years. Foreclosure is going to be three years FHA, seven years conventional. So that's like a little bit of a difference between the two. But, I mean, it's quicker for a short sale. Yeah. If, you, if you're if you doing a short sale, you can get in a lot quicker. So so the benefits, obviously, of doing the short sale is you're paying off the house. You're getting into that debt. Your credit's not really affected. And then you could wait and buy another home in two or three years once you get your feet and back up and running. Also, essentially, as a as a as a seller, right? As somebody who's in distress, when you're doing a regular sale, you're responsible for everything on title. When you're doing a short sale, the bank and the buyer is paying off your debt, so you basically have a clean slate for you to start all over. And people don't realize that it's like there are a lot of homes that are just vacant, and people walk away because they're not knowledgeable, and they they've also been misguided by other people who are taking their money, and they're like, I just. I don't want the headache anymore. I've dealt with, uh, you know, people going through short sales who are saying that, all right, I don't want to move unless I'm getting like relocation money. Bank gives relocation. Is money. that always a guarantee though? or It depends on the lender, but you also have to live in the property. Some people want relocation money and they're not living in the property, right? Like the property is completely vacant. Mm -hmm. The bank went to the bank, to the property. They see that it's vacant. You don't have any electrical. How are you asking for relocation money, right? What's the max you can get on relocation? I heard it was 10000 Yes. 10000 is the max. Before it was more. Before it was 10, 20, 30. Wow. Even some people were getting like 50000 Because remember, the bank wow. wants- That's insane. They, the bank really cannot foreclose on the property. Wait, just because you're, you're still technically the homeowner yeah. in the short sale process. process. You're saying for a short sale, you, yes. they got up to $50,000? Back relocation then, fee. Back wow. then, not yeah. now. That's crazy. Relocation which is, fee too. And they're getting all the debt. Like, paid off, which is yeah. crazy. So a lot of people are That's like, wild. you know how many people come to me? I have no debt. My credit is clean. I'm like, first of all, you're not paying your mortgage, so that's a sign. You have child support. If you're not paying, that's on that home. That has to be, it has that's to be a clean yeah. title, right? Child support, credit card, medical. There's a lot that's of people big. who- Somebody just had liposuction, never paid for it, and is on lean on the home. <laughs> and we have no. to clear that. Talk about priorities. <laughs> like, you know, like it's a lot of things that everybody's like, oh, well, I don't have anything. And also, it's not just you. If you have children and they live in that home, those judgments are valid. Everything is attached to that so person and to the home. So you're walking wow. away, essentially, like peace of mind and honestly being able to start all over. So before we move on to the next question I have, so is there any like is there any reason why somebody would go through the foreclosure route instead of a short sale? Can you touch on that? Would there be any reason why they would do that? They're not being, you know, knowledgeable or they're not going to the right person or at the same time sometimes the bank could refuse. Here's the thing. If you go to a bank and you say I want to do a short sale, but you already did three loan modification and you never pay those loan modification. And they see that you're just buying time because when you in loan modification, the foreclosure action stops. When you're in a forbearance, it stopped. They cannot foreclose on you, right? right? So when you're like, you know what, Mr. Bank, I really want you to help me. And you're doing that. And you've done that two or three times, right? And then you come and you're like, I want to do a short sell. And that investor didn't close for whatever reasons because the agent didn't do their homework and didn't confirm that you know that they qualified because a lot of people don't have the money right and they're just it's like a regular deal you can say that i can buy this house and i have a pre-approval but it's not by the right lender um so sometimes the bank will also come and say you've done this and you have a track record i am no longer going to offer you that option you have two options which is a deed in lieu which is like, give me back the property, but you're going to have a foreclosure on, on, your record. on your record. And for you to do that, a deed in lieu, um, you have to be the one to clear everything on your title. They do not take the, t the property back unless it has clean title. So essentially, if you're doing a short sale, right, and there is $50,000 in judgment, that buyer, 90% of the time is going to pay it because they want that property. But when you're doing a deed in lieu, it's just you and the bank. And the bank is going to say, 
well, I'm taking the property back. You have to clear this. And the only reason is because it's not as a foreclosure. It shows that it's a DD loan, but it still shows that a foreclosure. So essentially, if you're not doing your homework or people are just honestly, also there's so many different circumstances where people are not paying and they're dealing with tenants and they're like, I just don't want to deal with them. Not knowing that there could be somebody else out there that says, I will deal with them, you know, and they're just walk away and they're just like, I don't, they're not being informed. So there's a property have to be owner occupied or can tenants no. be in there? Okay. No. So it doesn't have to be. No. So last question I have for you is what do you think the future holds? Because a lot of people are saying 2022 is going to be the year of foreclosures and REOs, short sales. Like short sales. I look, I did a little research last week, like just to check and just in Long Island alone, I only looked at people who purchased in 2020 during COVID, which are the people that are qualified. There's already 20, I'm sorry, 200, few towns I did, 200 people who are already in default, right? 200 people 200 since 200 people 20, since 2020? 2020. And that's, oh my that gosh. was like a month ago that I checked. So people are saying it's not the same because they got lower rates. When people don't want to pay the rent, they don't want to pay the rent. And unfortunately, there's always going to be a business for it. Um, in my opinion, everybody who went into a forbearance, it's going like 50% of those people don't have the money to come up. And, and just, you know, they're like, oh, I'll just refinance. Or they're going for other people's opinion. Oh, you just wait. There are some grants that I've been informed, um, and, and I haven't done my homework a lot, so I don't want to touch on it. But there are some grants that my friend told me um, – that some banks are offering, but they already maxed out, right? They put it out there, and they're like, we'll give you up to, I think in New York it's $50,000 for you to come up, be up to date on a forbearance. But everybody wow. already jumped on that. So guess what? If if in New York 50,000 people didn't pay their mortgage and they only offer into to 1,000, that's already taken. In New York, if, if a lot of people are not, in my opinion, are not going back to the offices, so they're cutting down on all the people that were working and people are getting ill. And let's remember all the people that passed away due to COVID. Those are all essentially houses that are going to be in foreclosure. If those um, person didn't have a will, if, if, if they didn't, you know, if, if, if it was vacant and, and it was, you know, the family member is not taking the actions that they need to take, those are essential foreclosures. In my opinion, there's going to be a lot of foreclosure. In my opinion, um, however, a lot of people are waiting to buy these foreclosures. A lot of buyers are saying, I'm waiting to buy this foreclosure. But that doesn't mean you qualify for them. Yeah. Right? Because I don't, it, I, I don't essentially think that the prices of the houses are going to be lower. And now what I am seeing is there's a, foreclo- there's a short sale in this block. But all of the other houses sold for 607000 Those are my comparables. Right. So you could buy this house and if it's in excellent condition, because some pro- I've done short sale on property that are amazing condition. It's not just very distressed. Two hundred thousand dollars, three hundred thousand dollars. Now, what is the point of you buying this one at six hundred with a six percent, seven percent interest rate? Right now, it, it may be beneficial for an investor who's not who's buying cash and then just selling it later on, you know, and it's all about what works for you, right? Because I tell everybody, don't look at it as there's going to be foreclosure and I'm just going to wait for the market to crash. You're also hoping for somebody else's downfall. You hope, you know, you're (laughs) saying, oh my God, I can't wait for this person not to pay their mortgage so that I can benefit from it. But that's the real estate game if you really think about it. It's really cutthroat. Yeah, it is. It is. But there being more foreclosure does not mean that if you're not an educated buyer, right, and working with the right people, that you're going to get that, you're going to get a deal, right? Like, essentially, we see short sales from different people. Some are listed at $200,000, and some are listed in the same neighborhood for four fifty, right? Yeah, that's true. And you, it depends, you're not always going to get a deal. It depends who you work with. So that's why you got to contact yeah. Bright Horizons. <laughs> yes. <laughs> anything you could leave us off with. I mean, it's obvious that you're the short sale queen and we appreciate all your knowledge and everything. Is there anything else you want to leave us off with? Well, um, if you're an agent and you're looking to get into the into the short sale business, keep in mind that it is very lucrative. The bank pays you 
So don't shy away from it. Just get somebody that's going to do all the legwork for you. They're going to negotiate for you. They're going to walk you through it. I feel like a lot of agents just shy away from like, okay, I'm not going to do a short sell. It takes nine months. It takes a year. Not always. My turnaround time is anywhere from 30 to 60 days. Wow. So it's the same. And you're also working with your mortgage. You know, like once you get that appraisal, you know what that value is. You know what you're going to be able to get it for. So you go to the, you know, your loan officer, if it's a regular buyer, and you're like, hey, we already did the value. We're here. And the bank gives you 45 to 60 days to close from the short sale approval. So you have time. And they're always working with you. So I feel like a lot of agents don't know the foreclosure business, don't know short sales, and they shy away from it. And they're essentially leaving money on the table. They so pay contact good. contact her. <laughs> short sales definitely pay good. What about for homeowners? One last thing. What well, would if, be? if you are in, unfortunately in that, in that position, just inform yourself. Educate yourself. Don't go to a divorce attorney to talk about short sales, right? Don't go to an agent that only does um, a listing agent to tell you about how to get a buyer for it or how to, you have to, you know, network and be with the right person and be say, hey, I, I, I don't know this, but maybe somebody else can, you know, help me and collaborate with one another because that's the way that we can help other people. Listen, there's a, a lot of people out there. They're like, they're like, I'm happy that this investor bought this property because nobody wanted to, you know, the price of my house went up because now there is not an abandoned home or a house that looks bad and buyers don't want to buy. Like, we're essentially helping one another and just get informed and educated. There's a lot of free information out there. I have a website. Um, What's the website? Um, it's bright Her brighthorizonsny.com. Um, but there's a lot of things on YouTube. There's there's a lot of people that are putting content like you guys. And, and I feel like, I'm going to speak for the Spanish community, we honestly go to people that don't know and we're asking for That's advice. A fact. And it's just like because my uncle and, you know, like we know each other. Let me go to them. But essentially go to people that are actually going to connect with somebody that actually know and do your homework. At the end of the day, all of the information is out there. You shouldn't have to be foreclosed on. You shouldn't have to go through that. And it's honestly, there's nothing, you know, waiting till the last minute and then blaming others when you didn't look for the information and take took the actions that you needed to take. Well. A lot of knowledge, a lot of gems. We That's appreciate you coming. Oh, my pleasure. If you're an agent, definitely reach out to Melissa. Where can people reach out to your Instagram? Uh, short sales by Melissa. And the, you have a, a Instagram for the company as well? Or? No, that's all in one. Okay, we'll, we'll plug in the, the website and everything else. If you're a homeowner as well, going through some struggles, financial struggles, make sure you reach out to Melissa as well. We appreciate you being Thank here. Thank you, guys. Thank you. That was the latest episode of the Real Estate and Show podcast. We will see you next time. Thank you for tuning in to the Real Estate and Chill Podcast with James Chantry and Kevin Iglesias. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Also, share this with your friends, your enemies, your mother-in-law. No, seriously, this podcast is so fucking good, you might want to tell your ex. See you next time.